I started a, a series on Malachi last year, so we're picking up really where we left off. So uh, sorry for first years, haven't heard the, the first two installments, but I think you can listen to them uh, on tape. Uh, chapter 2 and verse 10 is where we're turning to this morning. I was going to use my normal preaching Bible um, to read the text, but uh, it's the old NIV. And I'm going to actually read from uh, the NIV 2011. Uh, no matter what version you're following with, it'll probably be a bit different here and there. So Malachi 2 verse 10, Do, do we not all have one Father? Did not one God create us? Why do we profane the covenant of our ancestors by being unfaithful to one another? Judah has been unfaithful. A testable thing has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Judah has desecrated the sanctuary the Lord loves by marrying women who worship a foreign God. As for the man who does this, whoever he may be, may the Lord remove him from the tents of Jacob, even though he brings an offering to the Lord Almighty." Another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer looks with favor on your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. You ask, why? It is because the Lord is witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Has not the one God made you? You belong to him in body and spirit. And what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. The man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect, says the Lord Almighty. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful. I was tempted to sing this, but I'll just say it. Love and marriage, love and marriage, go together like a horse and courage. This I tell you, brother, you can't have one without the other. I should have sung it. (laughs) Well, if love and marriage are the horse and courage, I suppose adultery and divorce are the coffin and the hearse. And this passage we're looking at today has it all, including some thorny exegetical issues as well. Sometimes we tell our students who are thinking of doing Hebrew that they'll see far more things in the Hebrew text than they ever would in an English translation. But that's not always a good thing. (laughs) Sometimes ignorance truly is bliss. (laughs) But while the, the finer details may indeed be somewhat obscure, the overall thrust, the theological message of our text is fairly obvious. The big idea is the need for faithfulness. Malachi's message is to be faithful in our relationships, both with God and with each other. And as we'll see, these two things are closely related. Loving God and loving one another really do go hand in hand. And that's clear from the very beginning of this passage. Look how Malachi starts. It begins with their relationship with God. But before verse 10 ends, Attention has shifted to the relationship with each other. And as Malachi explains, each involves a desecration of a covenant. That lies at the very heart of Malachi's concern here. By their own faithfulness, these people are breaking their covenant. They're breaking their covenant with God, and they're breaking their covenant with one another. And thus Malachi stresses the need for faithfulness. Faithfulness to God and faithfulness to to others. The first few verses, verses 10 to 12, focus mainly on the former, the need for faithfulness to God. Malachi begins here by underlining spiritual unity. Don't we all have one Father? Did not one God create us? Now, Malachi is not advocating here the universal fatherhood of God or the universal brotherhood of man. Rather, the we and the us here refers to the people of Israel, the covenant people of God. They're the object of God's fatherhood. They're the focus of God's creative act. Malachi is thinking here of those who are in covenant relationship with God and thus with one another. And that's what gives the following question its rhetorical clout. Why do we profane the covenant of our ancestors 
by being unfaithful to one another? Why are we doing things that are out of step with the plan and purpose of God? The one who made us, the one who called us his firstborn son. The one who created us to be his holy nation and royal priesthood. Why are we profaning the covenant that God made with our ancestors by being unfaithful to one another? That's the question Malachi is asking. And it's a question that we too may need to ask ourselves. For we likewise are part of God's family. Through union with Jesus, we share the same Heavenly Father. In Christ, we are a new creation, God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And those good works include loving God and loving each other. And that means guarding against unfaithfulness, whether respect to God or to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, we may not be guilty of the specific offenses outlined in our text, but that doesn't mean that we should pay little attention. No, we must take heed. Such unfaithfulness might well be evident in our lives also. So let's bear this in mind as we consider the examples of unfaithfulness we see depicted here. The first concerns the collective guilt of the nation. Judah, Malachi says, has been unfaithful. A detestable thing has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Judah has desecrated the sanctuary the Lord loves by marrying women who worship a foreign god. Now, some suggest the prophet is just speaking metaphorically here. Indeed, we might easily draw this conclusion ourselves, that Malachi is simply alluding here to ritual offenses, to religious syncretism, to blending the worship of Yahweh with the worship of some foreign deity, to reintroducing some kind of idolatry into the Jerusalem temple. But on closer inspection, it seems more subtle than that. The transgression relates not to spiritual adultery in general, but to something much more specific. Some men, it appears, were polluting God's sanctuary through marriage. Judah has desecrated the sanctuary the Lord loves by marrying women who worship a foreign god. May the Lord remove the man who does this from the tent of Jacob, even though he brings an offering to the Lord Almighty. Now, the issue, of course, was not that these women were simply foreigners. It was that they were idolaters, worshippers of a foreign god. But as such, the problem is that these Jewish men had become unequally yoked. They'd entered into a solemn pact, a marriage covenant, with non yahwists with what we would call unbelievers. And by doing so, they'd contaminated the ritual purity of the temple, They were jeopardizing God's covenant with Israel. And no amount of sacrifices would right this wrong. Such marriages had led to disaster in the past, whether for individuals or for the nation. And God had no desire to see history repeating itself, as it surely would. This is an issue that few of us here may be dealing with, but perhaps some of us are. Maybe in relation to your adult children maybe even ourselves if we're single. I recall facing it as a a very young Christian myself, a girl who had had a a great crush on for many years, let me know soon after I became a Christian that she wanted to start a relationship. And I was keen. I was very keen. (laughs) And it was very easy to to, to rationalize why I should go out with her. But instead, I, I reluctantly explained why I couldn't. Unless, of course, she became a Christian. (laughs) But she never did. It clearly wasn't to be. But perhaps you know of those who have made the opposite decision. And sometimes things have worked out okay. And sometimes they haven't. Yes, God can certainly override our foolish choices, our bad decisions. But he's certainly not obligated to do so. Sometimes we must live with the consequences of the mistakes that we make. But let's not get fixated on this particular matter, for those of Malachi's day were being unfaithful to God. See, maybe with us it's something else entirely. Maybe it's impure thoughts and desires, fed by sexually explicit movies or pornography. Maybe we fantasize or commit adultery in our hearts. And then there's all those other pitfalls that have nothing to do with sex. 
Let's not fall into the trap of the Pharisees, all too aware of the faults of others, but blind to their own transgressions. Those decisions that put us in breach of God's covenant. Those things in our lives to which Malachi's charge equally applies. Be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to God. The need for faithfulness to God, that's the first thing Malachi underlines here. And the second seems closely associated, the need for faithfulness to each other in verses 13 to 16. Another thing you do, says Malachi, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer looks with favor on your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. You ask why? It's because the Lord is witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Some of the commentators isolate two separate issues here, one related to their worship and another related to their wives. But surely the two things are much more closely connected. The reason God rejects their worship is because of their marital unfaithfulness. Flooding God's altar with tears, that stems from the fact that God was no longer looking on them with favor. He was no longer accepting their sacrifices. And the reason why was their unfaithfulness in marriage. God dis- disapproved of how they were treating the wife of their youth. Divorce, it seems, had become an easy option rather than a last resort. Rather than preserving the sanctity of marriage, such covenants were being willfully broken. Rather than protecting their spouse, these husbands were clearly doing them harm. Malachi describes it here, albeit metaphorically, in terms of domestic violence, doing violence. And it's tempting to to link all this directly with the problem highlighted back in verses 11 to 12. That is to think that these men were divorcing their wives simply to order to, to marry these other women who worshipped a foreign god. But such a connection is not actually made by Malachi. And it does seem an unlikely rationale. After all, rather than go through the messiness of divorce, presumably they could just have taken an additional wife if they wished. In any case, I think what we have in verses 13 to 16 is simply a further example of unfaithfulness. Not only are God's people breaking their covenant with the Lord, they're also breaking the the covenant with their wife. And they're doing so by unfaithfulness and divorce. This, as we all know today so well, can have dire spiritual consequences. Indeed, Malachi arguably alludes to such in verse 15, however we understand the details. As the NIV footnote points out, the meaning of the Hebrew for the first part of this verse is uncertain. And that's an understatement, I think. (laughs) Indeed, one translation that I looked at simply has, instead of translating the first part of the verse, simply has an ellipsis, dot, dot, dot. The mind boggles. One commentator, an evangelical commentator that I respect, notes that it's not at all clear what points three quarters of verse 15 is making, and he goes on to advise that the reader, uh, advise the reader that since nobody really understands the first part of the verse, the worst thing that could be done would be to assume that it can be understood. And no, he's not a Baptist. <laughs> he's not simply sidestepping a proof text for infant baptism. <coughs> I might be, but he wasn't. But while some of what is said here is a bit unclear, the reference to godly offspring is maybe less so. This arguably relates to the detrimental effect, the detrimental impact of divorce on the family, particularly on the family of God. So often today we hear about kids of divorced parents going off the rails, not attending church anymore, abandoning their Christian faith. But even if that's not what Malachi has in mind here, it's certainly something that we should consider in our era of easy and no-fault divorce. And however we translate the, the start of verse 16, God clearly disapproves of such. Malachi may not say that God hates divorce, but he certainly leaves us in no doubt about God's opinion on these particular proceedings. The man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect. God disapproves. It's difficult to argue that the biblical ideal for marriage 
is not a permanent relationship. It's even more problematic to maintain that divorce is a gift of God's grace, especially where no adultery or abuse or desertion is involved. Irreconcilable differences, incompatibility, simply losing that loving feeling. None of these seems to be valid biblical grounds for divorce. Yet apparently this is what was happening here in Malachi. These men have simply lost interest in the wife of their youth. Rather than offering love and protection, they've expressed hatred and violence in how they've treated her. And not surprisingly, Malachi calls them out. He urges his contemporaries to to amend their ways, to be on their guard and not be unfaithful. And this charge equally applies to us, especially those of us who are married. God calls us to be faithful. As Christian men, to be faithful to our wives. As Christian women, to be faithful to our husbands. Whether married or single, God calls us to honor the covenant of marriage, to keep the marriage bed pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. All of us, as members of God's family, must be faithful to God, and we should be faithful to one another. Yet like those of Malachi's day, so often we fail. We may not be guilty of adultery or domestic abuse, We may not have adopted a blasé attitude to marriage or divorce. We all fail in our faithfulness to God and each other. And no amount of weeping, no amount of sacrificial worship can possibly compensate for such. But thankfully, thankfully, like those in Malachi's day, we have a God who is faithful. We have a God who calls us to repent. We have a God who, through the obedience and sacrifice of his faithful Son, looks on us with favor, and does accept us with pleasure. Despite our many shortcomings, despite all of our unfaithfulness, we have hope because God is faithful. One of my favorite songs puts it like this. Faithful one so unchanging, ageless one, you're my rock of peace. Lord of all, I depend on you. I call out to you again and again. You are my rock in times of trouble. You lift me up when I fall down. All through the storm, your love is the anchor. My hope is in you alone. The night before my bypass operation, I played that song several times over on my iPhone. And you know, those words were a great comfort to me. My confidence, my peace, my assurance lay not in my own faithfulness, but in the faithfulness of the one whose steadfast love, whose covenant faithfulness endures forever. And yet, as we've been reminded, Malachi reminds us here that our faithful God calls on us to be faithful in our relationship with him and in our relationship with each other. So let me urge you, as Malachi urges his audience, to be on your guard and not be unfaithful for his name's sake. Amen. Now, unfortunately, we've all probably had some experience of marital breakdown among our relatives, our friends, uh, our church family. And Jane is going to come now and share some thoughts on how we might better respond to those kind of situations that we will inevitably face. Thanks, Paul. Um, I was looking forward to CMS summer school this past January, you know, being online for two years. So back in person, I thought, great. Um, A friend of mine, she was much more apprehensive. Um, Why? Because since the last in-person summer school, she had separated from her husband. She was nervous about seeing all these Christians and dealing with their reactions. So how did people react? Most people, wonderful. Some could be better, and others appallingly clueless. So what about us? What are some things for us to consider when a Christian tells us they're separated or divorced? Um, The following things that I'm going to share include some comments from men and women in the Moore College community whose marriages have broken down and have graciously shared some things with me. 
So seven things to keep in mind if someone tells you that their marriage has broken down. So number one, safety, safety. Are they and their children safe? Two, listen, listen and keep listening. Three, don't assume. Don't assume that you know everything about the situation. Be slow to form judgments. Four, remember that life is messy. And people like you and me typically don't like that. We want to fix things um, because that makes life more comfortable for us. We want a solution when someone tells us their marriage has broken up. A solution that seems so brilliant to us, but it's not necessarily a great idea. So for example, we can think that mediation for this couple would be excellent. It seems so obvious especially maybe if we've only spoken to one spouse. Mediation may work, but sometimes things like mediation are not the answer. Some people can completely manipulate a meeting like that. They say and act exactly how they should in the mediation session at home, they're a different person. So if someone tells you they don't want mediation, it may be because they understand their spouse better than we do. It's not always for a bad reason. So listen and don't assume life is messy. Number five, communicate clearly. For example, sometimes people will tell you they're getting divorced at a time that's not necessarily ideal for us. Um, not best for communication. You know, they might tell us late at night. They might tell us as, you know, we're walking into the AGM. If you have established that they're safe, say something like, um, I'm sorry for you, it must be awful. Thank you so much for telling me. I really wanna to speak to you about this when we have time, enough time, let's make a time now. Open up your diary, how about Tuesday, 11 a.m. Another way to communicate clearly is not avoiding saying difficult things. And that's, and we, we often have difficulty saying difficult things and in a situation like this, um, we can struggle more. Number six, don't shrink back from people. Don't shrink back. This person is losing most of the structures in their life and many of their relationships. They feel shattered. One man told me, I felt like I was standing at the beach and the wave came in and then it went out and so did most of my friends. The person um, needs friendships from both sexes, but if friends of yours are divorcing, be realistic about the new relationship dynamic if you want to stay close friends with both of them. Very likely, your friendship with one is dramatically changed or it ends. As one divorced man said to me, this is all part of the sadness of the whole thing. And number seven, keep being Christian. You may completely freak out, at least on the inside, when someone tells you they're separated. You know, you wonder, what am I supposed to say? What am I gonna say? Be heartened that the main thing you need to do is to keep being Christian. Be as Christ to them. As one divorced woman said to me, love, grace, kindness, compassion, gentleness, i.e. the fruit of the spirit and mercy are wonderful to receive in such a devastating time. So be encouraged by that to keep loving and serving those whose marriages have broken down. Thanks, David.